Okay, so we're going to go through the theory behind materials and light and color. The reason why we're going to go through this is because as artists, we are tasked with the need to create things that don't exist. Some things we can find that exist uh, maybe close to what we need to create. Uh, we'll, of course, be asked to create things that do exist, which we can you know, deeply reference and whatnot, and that's great. But it comes to those points when we have to create that which doesn't actually exist, that we need to understand the rules of how materials respond, how color responds, how light responds in different environments, different situations, in order to create something that is believable, something that people will look at and say, that's possible. And that suspension of disbelief is our responsibility. That's how we communicate with the audience and, and help them fantasize in these rich worlds that we're, we're tasked to create. Uh, if you've been through color theory before, uh, the, the essence of you know, complementary colors and you know, triads and all that kind of stuff is not what I'm going to talk about here. Um, that's all cool stuff to learn but uh, we're, we're going to go through just the basics of color theory as it responds in this digital environment and then we're going to move on to materials and stuff like that. So just really quickly, primary colors, red, green, and blue. In the pigment world, which is subtractive, it's red, blue, and yellow, but uh, here in digital, so be it Photoshop, painting, or dealing with Maya, or um, 3 Studio Max or Unreal or whatnot, you're dealing with light and the primary colors of light are red, green, and blue. Where this becomes important to you as a digital artist is understanding that mixing yellow and blue will not create green, not in this environment. That works with pigments and not with light. The idea here with light is that if you add red, green, and blue together, you will get a desaturated value, be it white or gray. So if we add red and green together, we get yellow. That means that if we add yellow to blue, that's all three primaries, right? Red and green come together to create yellow, then we add blue on top of that, that's all three primaries, which means white or gray. And this is sometimes something difficult for people to wrap their brain around because maybe they've been used to dealing with pigments throughout their artistic life. And you know this is like a primary rule. You, you take yellow and blue and you get green. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen here. So just come to terms with it. The idea of a complementary color is opposite ends of the spectrum. And so red and cyan here in the green in the um, uh, the, the spectrum of RGB light. Uh, anytime you deal with complementary colors, combine them in the digital environment, you're going to get a desaturated color. You're going to lose saturation. So um, cyan and red will give you, again, gray. Um, purple and green will give you gray. So just be aware of that when you're dealing with these colors. Materials. The material response I break down into a simple acronym. Uh, it's nice and easy to remember. ART, that's what we're creating, right? Art, um, and it stands for absorption, reflection, and transmission. Absorption is the first thing that you have to consider in terms of the value of the surface and the color of the surface. Uh, in particular, diffuse reflections, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, it determines the color because you can absorb all of the light that comes in, making it black, or you could absorb just certain spectrum of it. Say you were to absorb the red and green, but reflect the blue, and so this object would appear blue. When you're dealing with all of these things, um, you're thinking about how much of the light is being absorbed and reflected and transmitted in terms of a percentage, dealing with 100%. So if 100% light comes in, 90% is absorbed, only 10% is left to either reflect or uh, transmit through the surface. And you want to keep a loose kind of idea of that. Uh, as a CG artist, if you're using legacy shaders, something that's not energy conserving, then you're going to have to manually control some of that. And there's some other elements that will uh, mess with all this, things like Fresnel, uh, which we're going to talk about in a moment as well. 
So moving on to reflection. Reflection, again, uh, it hits the surface. Either it all reflects back, say something like white paper uh, or a um, metal, 100% reflection, right? It's all going to come back. Uh, but some of it uh, may be absorbed, so it may only reflect, say, red light, so, so like a red Christmas ornament. Um, it's reflecting all the red light, but absorbing the other range. You have two categories of reflection in terms of the digital world, um, in terms of what people will be talking about. So part of this, this talk is terminology as well. You have diffuse and you'll have specular. Diffuse reflections are things like uh, cloth, uh, paper, um, cement. These are diffuse reflections. They're not shiny, right? A specular reflection is polished. It's shiny. You can see, you know, things, the shape of the things reflected through it. Moving on to transparency, again we have that idea of spectrum, right? All of it goes through or just parts of it, you know, part of it could be reflected or absorbed um, and whatever is left will pass through. Just like we have the diffuse and specular elements here, we have a diffuse and specular idea, they're just called something different. So in terms of terminology, the specular, which is the polished where everything kind of comes through the way that it was in the first place. Uh, is your transparency. Translucency is the idea of scattering, so that would be the equivalent of your diffuse. So translucency, sometimes also referred to as SSS, subsurface scattering, right? It goes under the surface and scatters, subsurface scattering, um, is the idea that, you know, once it goes through, it starts to bounce around and sometimes it'll come back out in, you know, even the same area that it came in because it's reflecting internally and then coming back. So uh, while we deal with transparent objects and what we call the index of refraction, when it refracts the light through it, different things can happen. It can scatter or it, um, not scatter, but uh, break apart, so creating like a rainbow. Uh, or it can go through and bend and come through in a different location depending on the speed that it gets to travel through that surface. So these are things that we want to think about how they work. And when we get to translucency, it becomes a unique difficulty for the painter. Doing things like wax, skin, etc. You're often thinking about two types of lit surface. You have the light that has penetrated into the surface and now trying to move its way through, as well as the diffuse reflection, which you know, reflects off of the surface and it, it creates the contours. So the diffuse reflection is the one that's easiest for us to understand when we look at it. But we have to combine that with that transmissive surface where certain surfaces are thinner, the light may pass all the way through and be visible on the opposite side, whereas uh, thicker areas they'll pass through and it'll penetrate in somewhat linear, linear fashion, so following the form in a different way. So your lit surface via the internal reflection will look different from the lit surface on the outside. And I often, when I'm painting that, I'll paint it as two separate elements and then I'll combine them as layers, um, blending them together. Moving along with a bit more on reflections. The surface of the object Directly 90 degrees from that is what we refer to as the normal. If you're a 3D artist, you'll be familiar with the idea of normals. Face normals are exactly that. They go through that, and that's where that's coming from. For a reflection to work, using that normal as a point of reference, whatever you're doing to look at that surface, that angle that you get from there will be reflected, mirrored across in the reflected angle. So any light coming in at this angle will, will be reflected off from there. This is important to you in terms of being a, a painter because you may want to do something like paint a puddle. Uh, so maybe you're doing a matte painting or, or something else and you may have elements in your scene that should be reflected in that puddle. You want to know what you should be reflecting. So what you're picturing in your mind's eye is you're looking from your eye looking down to the, the puddle and then thinking 
if I was down at that puddle and I were to look up at that same angle, what would I see? What would be visible? And that's what you want to put in there. Now that's a complete change in overall perspective, right? You're looking at things from a different angle. So it's important for you to kind of try and picture that in your mind's eye and um, try and put that in there. You can't just take whatever is there, turn it around and reflect it. It's, it's not quite that simple um, in cases of things like, say, like a city or things where you have visible depth going on. So just be aware of that. So moving along, we are going to go to the next item here. Reflection. So uh, with this here, we're looking at reflection from the point of some of it being absorbed and some of it being reflected. This object here absorbs the red and blue light and reflects the green. This absorbs the green and blue light and reflects only the red. As a result, what you see here is the objects which are green will show up as black. This is an extreme case. Now, if you found yourself some Christmas ornaments that were particularly saturated, you would probably find something uh, would happen to the reflections. They would be darker, but not necessarily completely black. And that is uh, what you should expect because it's very difficult for you to find something that is that strict. So in CG, this would happen. Uh, any you know regular materials, uh, you make something you know 100% saturated red, you're going to get black reflections. So CG artists and you know painting artists should both be aware of this. Now, if we look at this object over here, we can see the reflection of the green cube. Uh, this diffuse green cube is still reflecting green light, be it diffuse or specular, doesn't matter. Uh, it's emitting green light through reflection. And so, of course, it shows up here. So while it won't show up here or be darker here, um, it, it's, you know, it's because it's green. So green light absorbed, red light absorbed, it's important. What's also important with this is the idea of bounced light. So not just the overall idea of ref reflection in this case, but in also diffuse situations. If I took this, uh, say, a diffuse red sphere and put it up against here, the idea of light hitting it and bouncing and you know, spilling across here is not a possibility. Uh, it, you, you may actually lose, get sort of like an occlusion shadow. Uh, now it's not going to, you know, it's not going to go black or anything like that. It's just not going to have as much light. So, uh, what you see here is this uh, occlusion shadow. It's a, a shadow which is just a sort of dropping of the light. So this area may get a little bit darker in a really soft kind of way, uh, as opposed to uh, getting a little bit of spill of red light coming off of it, and that's because it just absorbs it. It doesn't take it. So these are things that are important to you in the creation of this. Now, another aspect to loosely think about, so not you know a strict thing that you have to consider, just a loose thought process here. I have a red, a green, and a blue here, and adding them together, I get up to white. If I take the blue and take it down to roughly, say, 50%, uh, and I'll take the green and I'll bring it down to about, uh, let's say, 80%. I get this skin color. So um, if I would have skin next to something that's blue, I would get 50% of the value of the light that's coming off of it. And this is why this is something kind of important to think about, that in, in the case of say the green here, so in the red, I've got 100% red, it's going to be a full on reflection. Here I've got, you know, 80% of the green, that's going to be good. But the blue, the blue is down to 50%, which means in a, a blue version of it, it'll appear darker. So uh, we have to consider the spectrum and the values in here to a certain degree in order to, to accurately represent them. So again, something to loosely think about, if you don't do it exactly right, people won't judge you, just as long as that when you do the reflection, you're reflecting, you're, you're painting it in just green or red or blue in these kinds of materials, 
you're not you know painting skin color in the middle there because that's not going to make sense. Moving right along. So uh, let's actually before I go into that talk about Fresnel because that other one relates to Fresnel. Fresnel was this guy who looked at different reflective surfaces and noticed that there was this change in reflection across the angle that you viewed it. So uh, we were talking about you know the angle of incidence and stuff like that um, in this other section over here, right? Reflection angle. And in the terms of Fresnel, this is an important uh, consideration because in what you can see in this little painting here is that as we look towards our feet, we can see what's underneath the water. And as we look across it, across that lake to the side, it becomes more and more the reflection of what we see outside of the water, so not what's under the water. I can't see what's under the water over here, right? There's that change. And you'll notice that at any lake, and that's because from wherever you are, the stuff that's closest to you, you can look straight down. You're looking at it basically at a direct angle along its normal. And as you look further out into the distance, that angle changes. It becomes uh, more narrow. It comes closer to flat along its surface. What Fresnel noticed is that the closer you get to along its surface, the higher the reflection value gets. So you always start with a base reflection when you're looking directly at it, right along its normal. Uh, that's its base reflection. But as you move across, it always moves to 100% reflectivity along its edge. And this is all surfaces. Um, the only thing that will change that overall appearance is diffuse surfaces where the light is scattered, it's roughed up, which we'll look at in a moment. So um, Fresnel uh, is basically this rule of taking an index of refraction, a value, and determining what that base reflection is, the, the reflection when you look along its normal, and then always going to that amount. And that index of refraction value can change how quickly it increases. Um, it may be like a slow linear progression or it may be kind of nothing, 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 and then slowly or, or quickly, and that last little portion, it moves quickly to 100%, and that will change that, that, the appearance of that reflection. So different kinds of materials will respond in different ways. Now, of course, you have to consider things like waves and whatnot, because they change the angle, which changes the angle that you're viewing it at, and whether or not you can see through or you see the reflection. So you may notice sometimes in waves, uh, areas will appear darker and that's because uh, you're just picking up the light that's under the water as opposed to the reflect reflected light around it because you're changing the angle that you're viewing it at. So things that are more towards the angle of view towards you, you're looking into the depths, which of course the further down you look. Here it's shallow, we're seeing the light. Um, as we move deeper into depth it may also get darker, so that's another factor. So uh, Fresnel um, is, is dealing with that and uh, with metals versus um, dielectric, that's what they're referred to, materials, things that don't conduct electricity. Um, in some software you have the value of K which can be combined with the index of refraction and everything's okay, but most Fresnel shaders uh, deal with just one index of refraction, or they may even just deal with sliders, or it's completely faked. Um, and when you deal with metals, it's not the same. It doesn't function that way. If we look at this index of refraction, we can see there's quite an extreme change from 0.46 up to 1.66. All these values should be creating quite a difference in that base reflection, and yet they're sticking around in 97, 98, and there isn't even any real consistency in, in terms of how it responds. So um, you have to consider this, that metals are different. Their base reflectivity is often fairly high. And it's not directly related to that. Again, if you have that value of K, then you can get a, a greater response um, to it, which is your con conductivity, whether or not it's conductive. 
In terms of PBR, we deal with the idea of metalness. And so, you know, if it's a metal object, you just increase the metalness value and you get something closer. And you, you're basically eyeballing it. You know, you're not using science to figure it out, even though they're based on, on real terms that physically based um, render is, is based on the idea of all these things. But uh, as an artist, you can eyeball it, get it really close. And if it looks fairly similar, it should respond fairly well. Now the lowest one I can find in the metals is iron and that's 74% uh, so that's basically the lowest you're going to go for that base reflection, that area in there and uh, this is often where iron will appear a bit darker because it tends to absorb the other spectrum uh, obviously because it doesn't transmit so if, if it's not see-through that means that light has to go somewhere and if it's not reflecting that means it gets darker, right? So um, the reflections and the, the appearance of the surface may be a bit darker in terms of iron. Um, another thing to, to talk about with regards to this, and it relates to um, the idea of these waves here, <clears throat> the idea of specular and diffuse. We have a surface here, and I'm just going to move the polygons. And as I move them, they all start to pick up the highlight from that surface. A specular object is polished everything is flat and even and so we only really get one reflection of the light every light point across that that background space will be reflected individually in their own different quadrants and and that's what we get but with diffuse surfaces there's breakup and there's scattering and how broken up or not broken up and how many pieces uh, they they consist of will determine that in this particular case, I've had everything kind of bending towards it. This is another factor here that you should also consider in the ideas of things like curved surfaces. Uh, if you look into a spoon, you look at one side, everything is um, distorted a little bit, but essentially it's right side up. And if you look towards the inside of the spoon, your reflection will turn upside down. And why is that? Well, it's because if you look at the curved surface, whatever is here is looking up, and where here is looking down and so that would be looking towards your chin this would be looking towards your forehead so of course the image that you'll see is put upside down so the angle that we view things is determinant in that reflection so both in the case of diffuse as well as bent surfaces to show you a more extreme case I've got this other surface which is a lot more polygons so a ton more and I've just added a randomized to it so again, if I take that same thing from very flat to breaking up that surface, as I break it up, you get to the idea of like an ocean. You can see how that breaks up there. And as I increase the break up, and it's all those little individual polygons, you get more and more scattering of that surface. Um, and we can increase this to quite extremes. Uh, we could take something like this, and I can take the shader go to the attributes here, go to that blend shader, and I'm just going to take this eccentricity up. So basically I'm scattering along that surface. As I take that, that still is a reflection, right? It's still a highlight. You can see the center hotspot, but it just scatters across this whole surface. So, um, you know, brushed metal to, um, you know, uh, powdery surface, diffuse surfaces as basically that breakup. And so it's just more and more scattering across that surface. So that's the difference between diffuse versus specular. And um, this, these different transitions, um, you're dealing with this, the surface itself, if you're a CG artist, you might be thinking uh, ideas of a, a gloss map or um, a spec map, right? A spec map will control its, its value between its diffuse reflection and its specular reflection. Um, and that's, again, based on you know areas that are more rough than others. But there's a point at which you're dealing with you know the, the bumpiness of that surface. And um, here you're not going to see much of a change, even though that I'm I'm dragging it, uh, because I'll 
should change. It's no longer changing. So if we go back to this, the roughness is not as small or finite. Um, it's, it's larger. And so this would be something that would be more like a normal map or a bump that map that you would be applying to it. So this is not a, a diffuse or spec map kind of situation or a gloss map kind of situation. This is physical changes. If you touch the surface, you can physically change, feel the, that, that roughness to it. That's when you're looking at a bump map or a normal map. So if you can feel the changes in height, go with a normal map or a bump map. Otherwise, uh, if you, it still feels kind of smooth on that surface of the, the material that you're trying to reproduce, then you're dealing with the idea of either a gloss map or going with you know, a spec map to control areas that are a little bit more polished than others. So continuing along, taking all that we've learned about thus far, in the past uh, 26 minutes. Um, we have things like Fresnel. We have the idea that some values will be reflected and some will be um, absorbed, etc. But what we're not necessarily thinking about yet um, is, is included here in this chromatic dispersion uh, collection. The soap bubbles here, Fresnel is responding differently to each range of light the red, green, and blue. Each one has sort of a different Fresnel value. If I wanted to reproduce this in CG, that's essentially what I'd be trying to do. I'd try and change that based on, on uh, these factors. Another element to this is that the different materials that make up the soap, the different chemicals, can be scattered across there, creating um, an unevenness, so maybe distorting that a little bit in order to get that effect similar response here to gasoline on you know cement and whatnot which creates this rainbow color we have the idea of a prism that depending on angle the light comes through but it bends and comes out at different ranges because the light itself has different speeds and um, because of that angle we see it separate and of course there's some bugs that have you know iridescent or whatever kind of colors to them that respond similar to this but again essentially the same rules so the idea is that each range of color is responding differently to the rules that we've been discussing. Reflection angles, Fresnel, uh, absorption rates, etc. Now we want to deal with light passing through atmosphere or passing through a surface. So this is uh, in the same idea of the tr uh, transmission, but in this particular case we have to consider the fact that our atmosphere is uh, a case of transmission as well. Light is passing through it and either scattering or not. So we've got you know uh, a diffusion of light. So this is our sort of our subsurface scattering or translucency, but it's applied to the atmosphere. Uh, when light comes through, the stuff that penetrates the easiest is the red. Things like the blue, violets, and and indigos tend to scatter throughout the sky. So going through this, we have the things that scatter the most, the easiest, down to the stuff that scatter the hardest. They're, they're, not, they're not easily scattered. When we look at a sunset kind of situation, we'll notice that um, areas lower in the atmosphere will pick up the reds. Well, if we look through the clouds here towards the uh, sky, the sky will still be blue. And that's because the scattered light in the upper atmosphere is still, still there. And as um, the scattering has happened here, the further we get from that source, the less of it will still be visible because it's scattered all over. It's just, you know, it's, it's spread out. So we'll be looking directly through to see things like starlight and whatnot. Um, the clouds being lower in the atmosphere, they're not high up, high, high up in the sky in this upper range, right? They're, they're down closer, they're down closer to the earth they have that red because that's what it's going through. So the more atmosphere that light has to pass through, the more likelihood we have of just the red and oranges and stuff to, to actually be there. If we look at this distance, if I go from here to this point on the Earth, right, you can see how far that length is. However, if I go directly here, so if the sun 
is going there. You notice that's a much shorter distance, meaning more of that light could pass through and we'll get more of those blues and greens and other colors. So that's why the, the sun, sunset works in that way. If we take a look at this from a different point of view, we'll go with Sebastian and Ariel under the sea, we'll notice that things change. First off, Fresnel has its little play. Uh, light at a glancing angle will be reflected off the surface and won't come through. But more than that, the light scatters differently. Red is more easily scattered and typically lost um, at a lower range, so within only a few meters of the surface. And the blue is what tends to last longest. So as you see here, you know, the red scatters first, and the orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet uh, going further, which is why under the sea, it tends to be more colors of greens and blues that we see under there. How does this affect us? Well, there's a number of things that we have to think about if we wanted to give the idea of water um, being under the water and the light. The glancing angle lighting won't be visible unless there's a light source under the water we're not going to get light from that position what we're going to get light from is from the top where it can pass through the stuff that can go straight through and straight down um, so that's one factor the other factor is any kind of red values and stuff like that are going to be lost fairly quickly under the water in the case of this pool we look down here and the skin has sort of a grayish tinge to it right we're seeing the blues and whatnot by the percentage of light that's there. If we look at the bottle, which would typically be sort of a brownish reddish color, it's not there because that light has been scattered. It's not reaching it anymore. And so it's uh, absorbing the other ranges of light outside of the, the reflection, which is again Fresnel. So while it's not getting as much of the light, it's also missing certain elements of the light. So it essentially appears black. And any of this blueness that we see in between it is just, um, um, I guess, the result of considering this sort of like a fog. So under the water, we'd be producing sort of like a fog-like effect. Uh, that would be the color of the water, the blueness that we have here. And then any of these elements would also be affected by that. So things to consider when you're dealing with uh, um, underwater lighting, the changes of that. Another thing to consider under the water and on air, uh, out on, on land, is the index of refraction, the value of index of refraction, determines how reflective and how refractive a surface is. If we look at this, we have the index of refraction of air. Air is in this tube, so we've got like a, a test tube with a, a glass rod in the middle, and it's surrounded by air. And so, of course, we see the rod very clearly because the difference of refraction between 1 and 1.5 is relatively large. If we move to water, putting water in that atmosphere, we're going from 1.33 to 1.5 the difference between them is much less. As a result, the distortion that it causes is much less, and the reflection that we see is also much less. As we move to an oil, which also has the same refractive index, 1.5 and 1.5, we no longer see the glass rod because they're manipulating light in the same way. And so they basically join to forces together and, and you just don't see it. The, everything's being distorted exactly the same amount. There's no difference between distortion of glass versus distortion of water or the way that it reflects the surface. So um, we basically lose it. So um, when you're dealing with that underwater scene again, that bottle, its reflection is lessened, its distortion is lessened, just as you would have here. So that's another thing to consider. What's also kind of interesting here is that um, just as we have here where we have the air to the glass or air to water, um, if we go underwater, air itself becomes reflective. 
because again that's that difference in reflection it's creating the uh, appearance of, of a distortion because again it's about the difference how far apart are they if there's a distance between them then you're going to see a change in how um, what you see behind them and what you see from front of them uh, looks like and so uh, if we we're in CG we would just go ahead and make spheres and put a glass shader on them or a water shader on them to give the same uh, appearance so even though the idea is that we're under the water in order to reproduce that same effect because it's about the difference here we would just apply that um, 1.33 index of refraction to the material on these things to give the same effect to make it look correct just a weird thing so the next thing that we want to know about is this diffuse surfaces wood um, concrete etc when you get it wet it gets darker so even though this material that's been applied to this is completely clear um, it somehow becomes darker when we apply it to these diffuse surfaces so the scattering that we looked at inside of Maya there with the, the surface um, it's it's scattering everywhere but when we apply water we're creating this coating across it which is smoother and it's smoothing out the roughness of that surface so that's one factor in darkening it we're basically dealing with the idea of light now hitting it and reflecting off in very specific locations it's not it's not responding the same way so we don't have as much of this roughness that's there so that's one factor it's not the only factor but it is one factor another factor is if you've been in a pool or you've looked in a fish tank and you look at it from the side when you can see the top of the water you'll notice the top of the water looks fairly reflective just like you would have on the opposite side light that ends up passing through and hits a surface will then try and bounce back out again but it may hit it at an angle that uh, reflects it back because Fresnel applies in both directions um, you're, you're getting that same kind of rule so what will happen is light will go in there it'll hit that surface some of it will be absorbed some of its reflected and then it hits this surface again but then is getting reflected back some of it may get out but uh, a lot of it uh, may be reflected back depending on the angle and it hits that surface again and so more of it is absorbed and then even less of it's coming back and it may be trapped almost indefinitely depending on the angles that it's reflecting out so not only is some of it lost through a specular reflection a single highlight or, or two in different locations uh, less of the light is going through and penetrating the the water less of it is also getting out because it can get trapped in there and so as a result these objects look darker an easy way of re reproducing this effect if you're trying to do it to a texture is just to affect the gamma in that area you can alter the gamma or you can do something like a levels and that middle value the middle value in the levels is the same as gamma so basically making something look wet is just the alteration of its gamma exposure so as we move along here uh, dealing with the idea of light we have to deal with the power of light how powerful light is and what range we can see if you've worked with cameras before you get the general idea of exposure more light being let in or less light being let in and then exposing it with our eyes it works much the same way although we have a different range of light that we can see we can see more light with our eyes say than with uh, this and it also dynamically changes it's constantly altering itself as it goes through uh, as we look in a darker area our eye will expand to let in more light and as we look at a brighter area it will contract to let in less light cameras have uh, a manual exposure that you have to change here's the same scene twice so it's just a separation here and what you can see here are the curtains but you can't see outside the difference of light is is too extreme if I change the exposure I can see outside no problem but I can't see the curtains they're too dark so this uh, this idea of exposure is something that we should think about as we're painting things situations such as this if we looked at the trees what color are those trees 
Those trees are green. They should be green anyways, but here they appear almost black, just as the rock, which should be gray, is also appearing black. We're doing this because the snow, which is highly reflective, it's an extremely reflective surface, is um, going to be blasted out to bright white. And so uh, if we want to be able to see the details of these snow drifts and all this cool stuff, these shadowing in here, without losing that detail, we have to lower that, um, or I guess, in, um, yeah, lower the exposure so that we can see those things. As a result, the lowered exposure creates other objects which would have been bright and vibrant to be darker. Um, this again is something to consider when we're dealing with CG or hand-painted situations. Uh, the sky will also be a bit darker as a result to, to mimic that. So um, you want to think about this when you're painting these things to get again something that feels believable, something that feels real life. If you're going to be doing a snow-like situation or dealing with the idea of uh, different exposures, you, you have to be aware of you know that that range. Um, one area where we tend to break this rule is nighttime scenes. Uh, at night, when we're look at, looking around, we see all that that variation. Um, our eyes are constantly changing. So a day for night scene or whatnot, um, often they'll shoot like a daytime scene and we'll convert it into a nighttime scene through editing. Um, but you want to give the illusion that things are a little bit more lit than they are. So we're breaking the rules of what an exposure situation would really look like. So for artistic purposes, you can break this rule to a certain degree, but you should be aware of it depending on how um, much you want people to accept the image in front of them. Just some terms for additional research. So if you want to go out and research more about some of this stuff, um, there's some terms with regards to how light is measured. We have this idea of a foot candle, and it's basically the distance from the candle source to one foot, how bright it is at that location. That's equivalent to what we refer to as a lumen. It's uh, equal to one foot candle. So if we're talking about lumens, it's about the distance from one candle and how bright it would be. The term a lux, lux is basically just a one meter squared um, collection of lumens. Uh, it's just uh, rather than a single point, it's an area calculation. When we're dealing with light sources that are not candles or the sun or whatnot, we may be dealing with the idea of watts. How many watts are there and how that relates to lumens? Well, watts is actually a poor measurement of uh, calculating light. And the reason for this is about the amount of energy, so energy efficiency going into the watts plus its efficiency there will equal the certain number of lumens that it produces. So if you can get the, the, the amount of lumens something is, if you're working with um, lighting instead of sort of a CG environment, so if you're CG lighter and you want to get accurate representation of the lighting, um, you should be looking at the amount of lumens it produces because uh, watts is a poor measurement system. Um, moving forward, there's another factor here that we want to take into consideration. Um, here's a situation where the lights are on inside. We can see about the door here. Like this. A glass surface uh, is mostly transparent. So remember we were talking before about ART and how reflective a surface is or how transparent it is. We're dealing with 100%. If most of the light is going through, so uh, basically 90, 97% uh, of light is passing through of it, that glass is only reflecting a 2 to 10 percent amount of light off of it. If that's the case, why am I not able to see through? Well, this also breaks into the idea of exposure as well. I look through here, there's nothing blocking the amount of light that I'm seeing, so I can have this. But the amount of light that's coming off of this is actually brighter, and this is because of this the sun. So remember I said Watts is a poor representation of this. 
Um, this is um, 1,367 watts, that's the sun, uh, versus a 60 watt light bulb. Now its efficiency comes into play, I mentioned this, and so the, the, the 60 watt, typical 60 watt light bulb is um, 50 lumens per watt, right? Um, so that's its efficiency, which obviously changes it. So 15 lumens per watt. Um, and then of course its size has a factor, how big it is. It's a small thing, so it's not very big. And the end result is we get you know, roughly 900 lumens off of it. The sun, however, is really efficient it gets 93 lumens per watt. So you take that, you multiply it by that number, and then of course it's a huge object, so you're gonna have to deal with that particular factor, and that's how many lumens it's producing. Now some of that's broken down the atmosphere, light is scattered, uh, reflected, etc. It doesn't pass through the same way. And so some of that, that overall uh, energy is lost, but even if we were dealing with a small percentage of it, uh, it's it's still very high. Now, considering um, we have, uh, say, 97% of that light, of the light sources coming through, but they're competing against, you know, 2 to 10% of this value, it's still going to be significantly higher than this value, and so that's why we see it first. It overpowers everything else. So this is something to consider with regards to reflections of glass. Um, even though the lights may be on in, outside, or inside rather, um, you may not see what's in there because the light coming from inside is not as strong as light reflected off the surface, even at low percentages. So this is again something to consider for uh, CG artists, if you want to represent your world accurately, as well as painters um, trying to recreate uh, scenes that don't exist. So this has been an overall talk through the base rules of this. Each one of these categories you could dig much deeper into, uh, go over it a lot further, but um, this has uh, been 47 minutes of this, so I'm gonna cut it off here, and hopefully you've learned something interesting.